So with that, I think we can start today's uh, session here. And I, uh, I'd like you to welcome you all to this uh, public defense of Merdad Sarantman. Uh, and uh, this uh, session, the first part of this uh, Merdad's presentation, it will be filmed and we'll put on YouTube later on uh, as part of all uh, the defenses in the It's Easy we Graduate School. And for that reason, all, and maybe also for other reasons, it's a good idea to mute your phones at this point in time. Okay. Uh, I have done so, I think. <laughs> uh, so, besides uh, Merdad being the, um, the main attraction here today, uh, we have uh, another set of very important persons here today to help to co execute this uh, uh, this proceeding here. So we have the, the faculty opponent, uh, Vittorio Cortadesa from uh, L'Aquila. And uh, we have a grading committee, uh, also from L'Aquila, Antonio Bartolino. Pisa. Ah, all right, sorry. Uh, and um, and uh, from, uh, now let's see, this must be at the boy next thing. Order. <laughs> <laughs> you go on distance. Then. Yes, I go with distance, and, uh, and I just sort of, of course, uh, I was thinking where, where we should put uh, TV here, yeah. but it is his local. So yeah. uh, we have Jan Bosch from Chalmers in the committee, and we have uh, from from ABB Corporate Research Tiberius Cecilano TV. Um, the grading committee will, after this uh, public session, uh, gather together with the opponent. And the advisors, and the advisors are myself and Antonio, uh, uh, to have a close meeting and discuss the outcome of uh, this defense and the grade on the thesis. So that's uh, the two first phases are covered. We have the public, the, the, the presentation of, of Merdad, which will be followed by uh, questions from Vittorio, and then some quest further questions from the committee. After that, it's open for questions from the audience, which will then conclude this open part and the closed session with the committee opponent and advisors will take place. During the closed meeting, there will be some refreshments in Java. And after we have had our meeting, we will, the, the committee will announce the decis decision that, we, that will conclude the, the formal part of this day. Um, Yes, with that I think we could start, so I'll leave the floor to you, Mara. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, also thank you all for uh, being with us uh, here today for uh, this event. Uh, my name is Mehta Salatman, and uh, this is the presentation of my doctoral thesis titled Preservation of Extra-Functional Properties in Embedded Systems uh, Development. So, uh, we developed software for different types of systems and uh, in doing that we apply different methodologies with different techniques and tools. But there is one common goal that all of us follow and that is basically to deliver a software product that satisfies uh, different requirements that we receive from uh, all the stakeholders that we have in the system. So towards this goal, among many other activities, we, what we do is that we select system components that have certain properties and then we verify that uh, the end product also has the desired properties that we want. In this regard, we can identify two main challenges. So first is uh, coming up with a system design that uh, ha respects the desired set of uh, properties that we are uh, interested in, and then ensuring that those properties remain valid in the final product that we deliver. Uh, execution of the, of, this, uh, of the system is also very important in this uh, respect. So basically, a requirement is a statement of a need, and uh, generally they are categorized into functional requirements, which simply state what the system should do, and non-functional requirements, which describe how a system should perform or act. And non-functional requirements are usually captured by expression of extra functional properties that, dis that describe quality attributes of a system. There is some relationship between non-functional requirements and extra functional properties in, the, in this context. For example, if you consider that we have a component which has a worst case execution time of 100 milliseconds, we, we will not know if that, that certain component is good in a specific design or context or not. It's only in re relationship to a requirement that we can then talk about uh, its appropriateness to, to be used for a specific system or context. Coming to embedded systems, uh, these systems are computer de uh, devices that are designed to operate as part of other systems. And uh, 
uh, because of that, they usually have interaction with their environments and they also have uh, limited resources. And these features or these characteristics brings, al uh, brings along additional uh, non-functional requirements such as on timing, on, on uh, security and safety in these systems. And uh, there are cer uh, certain challenges with respect to non-functional requirements and one of them is that they are interconnected and in satisfying non-functional requirements we need to consider the trade-off between them and uh, we need to balance them. So to ensure the correctness of the produced system uh, with respect to non-functional requirements, uh, we need to, uh, during the development phases, we need to preserve the properties that uh, we are interested in and, uh, and this preservation also includes the execution of the system in the final uh, step. And uh, this is also acknowledged in the literature by, for example, saying that uh, it is actually the object code that is flying an aircraft or shuttle and also in the model we, we can capture appro approximation of the timing behaviors of the uh, final system. Moreover, uh, regardless of the type and amount of analysis that we, we perform beforehand, if uh, during execution of the system there is some deviation between the expected properties and the actual ones that are uh, occurring during runtime, then th the system uh, may be considered as a failure, especially in, in, uh, in the context of embedded systems. So now we look into the context that this research was formed. Uh, we have model-driven development as a promising approach that can help us to tackle with the complexity issue of embedded systems. It helps to uh, raise the abstraction level to perform analysis early, uh, earlier in the development phases and also we can have generation of code from the model. Uh, in this context, uh, the way that we want to uh, detect if there are any violations with respect to extra functional properties or not, monitoring can serve as a uh, as a technique in, uh, in, this, uh, in this regard and the monitoring inf information that we, co uh, uh, that we collect can be used for performing runtime ad adaptation to enforce system constraints or to uh, in testing activities and also we can uh, simply provide the information that we collect during monitoring back to the user so that then they can uh, decide to perform modifications on design models or uh, some other changes. But in order to perform monitoring, especially for extra functional properties, the execution platform, of course, should have certain capabilities. So the goals that we were following in this research work uh, uh, are these three ones, uh, the, main, uh, the main research goals. So we wanted to define an approach for establishing balance between non-functional requirements at the model level. Then we wanted to come up with a uh, design model that preser preserves the extra uh, functional properties of interest, and finally, uh, a framework that uh, can perform monitoring uh, of external functional properties, uh, particularly here in this work, uh, we look at timing properties and also testing of these properties in the final product. So this work is based on several uh, uh, principles and assumptions. First of all, we consider that for uh, an external functional property that we want to preserve, we can consider uh, a set of acceptable and valid values and uh, the, uh, the values that fall out of this set will be then considered invalid. Uh, also, we perform analysis uh, uh, throughout the system development and uh, these analyses that we perform are based on some assumptions and preconditions. And uh, during runtime, if uh, these assumptions are violated, th then the, uh, the analysis result that we have uh, achieved can be considered not relevant for that system or can be considered uh, erroneous. And there are several factors that can co uh, contribute to this violation of analysis assumptions. For example, if we have dynamic voltage frequency, uh, frequency scaling in a system, and we have considered the worst case, uh, uh, we have performed a schedulability analysis considering a certain worst case execution time of tasks. And uh, during execution of the system, this uh, uh, DVFS feature is uh, turned on and uh, which leads, for example, to having to, uh, to have the CPU performing at a lower frequency, then those uh, execution times that we have assumed in our analysis will not be valid anymore uh, and uh, then it can cause some problems. On the other hand, uh, it, it may not be practical or economical to perform analysis on all types of extra functional properties and especially in the context of uh, complex systems. And uh, in these cases, uh, runtime monitoring becomes even more important. And uh, as we go down through the abstraction levels, extra functional properties can be uh, refined into one or more other uh, properties at uh, uh, lower abstraction levels. So uh, 
what we mean by preservation in this context is basically that we want to keep extra functional properties in their uh, range of valid values and uh, this uh, is based on the assumption that there is some knowledge about what means a valid value for an extra functional property and what uh, uh, constitute invalid uh, values. So the contributions that we have uh, uh, provided as part of this work is uh, listed here uh, are listed here and uh, the first one is a solution for generic modeling and analysis of non-functional requirements. We also propose a solution to establish balance between timing uh, properties in the system and secur uh, security properties. We do it in two different uh, ways. The first one is a static approach and then a dynamic approach. We also uh, enrich the platform uh, to extend it for uh, monitoring of additional timing properties and enforcement of these properties. And then we use this monitoring information also to fine tune design models uh, with respect to extra functional properties. And finally, we will uh, uh, introduce a testing framework that uh, enables automatic generation of test cases to verify the actual behavior of a system versus its uh, expected behavior and uh, some extensions in that testing framework to enable uh, generating test cases for timing properties. Now we go uh, and have a look at, uh, in more detail at the, uh, these contributions. So the first one is uh, a generic modeling of non-functional requirements uh, and also their analysis. So we talked about the relation between non-functional requirements and extra functional properties and for that reason we need to start from uh, the requirement uh, uh, level. And uh, we talked that non-functional requirements are interconnected and therefore we need to establish balance uh, between them, especially in the context of uh, embedded systems. And then uh, uh, considering a, a, a fixed set of uh, functional requirements, if we change non-functional requirements on th that set, then uh, we, we may end up uh, adopting different design decisions and implementations for a system. So what we offer here is a, a UML profile for capturing these non-functional requirements, as we call it an uh, NFR profile. And uh, by, uh, by uh, Applying uh, model transformation techniques, we enable automat uh, automated analysis of requirements. So in this figure, uh, you can see a small part of a mobile phone system and the, the requirements in this system that are captured with the, with the profile. So here, for example, we have a requirement on uh, camera picture quality in this system and another one on battery life. And then we have two features in the system, uh, the type of lens and having a flash feature that contribute to the satisfaction of this requirement. But having a flash feature also ha has impacts on the on battery life in this system. Therefore, th it, this is captured with this uh, impact uh, uh, link here. And then we, we specify priorities. These are the end uh, user priorities that we specify for different features that are interesting uh, for the customer. And also the same thing uh, for the requirements here at this level. And based on this information, uh, this model is fed to the transformation engine and we perform uh, some uh, analysis on these uh, different properties and what we get here is that we get some numbers for the satisfaction values as you can see here and also an, a number for the overall uh, uh, for the system as the overall value and we also introduce uh, the, the concept of deviation indicator value for uh, non-functional requirements here as you can see uh, here we have a deviation indicator value of 4 and which means that we have a high deviation from the ideal case which is when the satisfaction value of this requirement will be equal to 1. So we can repeat the same process, the same analysis, but this time without having the flash feature and as you can see, now this uh, deviation here is gone and we can achieve a, a satisfaction of 1 for this uh, requirement. On the, on the other hand, by removing flash feature, now we in introduce some other deviation for this other requirement in the system. So th this deviation indicator value for uh, requirements that we introduced here can help to identify parts of the system that, are, that have potentially severe problems. And based on that, uh, we have also showed uh, how it can be used to prioritize test cases and testing activities uh, to focus on uh, these problematic parts of the system. Moreover, this, uh, uh, this value can also uh, tell the end user th uh, about the potential candidates for modification in different parts of the system to achieve a better overall satisfaction of requirements. Then, as I said, by having a model transformation techniques, we provide an automated analysis here. And then our vision is that this analysis can be repeated several times during the life cycle of the application. And even uh, at runtime, if we want to perform reconfiguration, we can also, again, uh, 
uh, invoke this uh, analysis and then we, we evaluate different uh, configuration based on their, uh, the way that they contribute to the overall satisfaction of requirements. In this work, we had the assumption that the user can provide quantitative values for different uh, impacts and relationship between features and requirements, <coughs> and which makes it a little bit hard to apply in practice. Therefore, we also propose a fuzzy version of this method where the, uh, it becomes a lot easier to apply the method in practice. And as part of it, we also perform optimization, which means that we, if we have different types of, for example, flash, uh, flash features in a system, we can identify the ones that uh, in the end lead to a better overall satisfaction of requirement in the system. And we optimize uh, based on these uh, different features. So at the next level now, we want to establish balance at the model between uh, timing properties and security. Security in embedded system is uh, particularly interesting as uh, we, we now have an increasing use of embedded systems in uh, uh, network systems and also the, uh, the application of these devices, such as in power plants, in the vehicular system, medical devices, uh, makes it uh, uh, in a way that we, we now have tighter relationship between safety and security in these systems. The operational environment of this system also makes them exposed to uh, a specific type of uh, threats. Uh, moreover, uh, as we said that embedded systems have uh, limited resources, therefore in, uh, in, in introducing security mechanisms, we need to take care of the implications of these security aspects. Mobility is another aspect of these embedded systems. For example, it is not, uh, now not only the, the end user data that are carried around with these uh, devices, but also uh, operating system firmware and also enterprise algorithms of different companies that are on these devices. So, uh, as I said, we will look at uh, two different ways to achieve a balance between security and timing properties. The first one is a static one, as we will look here. So, what we basically do is that in the component model of, of the system, we identify sensitive data entities. And based on that, we automatically drive a component model that protects these uh, data entities. So, uh, this idea is captured in this figure here. So at the top, we have the component model, and then we, have, we create a data model of the data entities that are uh, communicated between different components in the system. Uh, we, we annotate uh, those data entities with security uh, annotations. We do the same thing for the physical platform that the system is going to be in, uh, deployed on. And based on that, we perform a model transformation. We drive a, a component model of the system with now including security components. Then we feed it to the analysis engine and then uh, we evaluate if everything is okay or not and we can repeat the same uh, process until we achieve uh, satisfactory results. And afterwards, we can synthesize the system. So here what we see is a, is a, a component model of an automatic payment system and we, we have different uh, nodes and uh, different components that uh, send data to each other. We also, in, as part of the approach, we have a table for different uh, encryption algorithms with their timing properties. And uh, based on that, what we achieve in the end with, this, with applying this approach is that this is the, the component model of the uh, uh, part of the component of the system before the transformation. And after performing the transformation, what we get is a component model that includes these security components. For example, here we automatically uh, uh, include this encryption component here, and, and at the other side, we now have the decryption component. So this, this method actually allows us to focus on uh, uh, sensitive data instead of uh, uh, looking into the architectural models, and then the designer can, uh, can, uh, uh, can annotate this sensitive data without needing to know how to actually implement these different security uh, features. We also provide a, a, a certain type of uh, uh, separation of concern here with this uh, approach and also it is important to bring security uh, features into earlier phases, phases of development which our proposed solution allows this uh, capability. Moreover, as you, uh, uh, as you saw, we, we have uh, a table for timing properties of different encryption uh, algorithms, but the reason that we don't claim that the derived component model actually satisfy the timing properties that we want is that we cannot, uh, we cannot assume that the, the overall timing, execution time of these components will be the addition of these uh, small pieces. So we have some 
probably overhead for communication and other features. Therefore, we, we also perform another uh, round of analysis on that. And again, we also provide an automation to, uh, in, in this uh, approach. Now we will have a look at the dynamic solution that we propose to establish balance between timing and security. Uh, what we basically do is that we, we at runtime we select appropriate encryption al uh, algorithms that help uh, that help to mitigate uh, violation of uh, timing properties at runtime, and this is particularly interesting for systems with high complexity, which are hardly analyzable, or uh, in in, con in the systems where we don't have uh, detailed. Uh, information about the timing behaviors of uh, uh, components in that system. So the, me the mechanism is uh, simplified in, in these two uh, sentences. If we have a higher processing load, what the system does is basically that it adopts a less strong encryption algorithm, which is assumed to be also uh, more time efficient. And then when this uh, uh, processing load uh, decreases, we go back to using the stronger encryption algorithm which is uh, more time costly. The implicit point, point in our approach is that it is basically more costly to interrupt a task when we detect some timing violation and then restart the encryption process with, uh, with another encryption uh, algorithm which is uh, uh, better in terms of timing uh, properties. So this shows how the approach works. So if you have a, a request for encrypting some data, it is sent to this uh, encryption process and uh, we keep a history of how the encryption algorithms have been performing in the system. Mm -hmm. And this process, by, uh, by consulting this history, will select one of the available encryption algorithms. And here we have a ranking table for uh, different uh, encryption algorithms. For example, at the top, we see the AES uh, encryption algorithm, which is uh, here uh, is the strongest, but also assumed to, to take more time to execute. And then we sort them based on these uh, characteristics. So here you see how the system performs. At, uh, at this time point, we have, uh, we have been using this uh, AES algorithm, which is the strongest in our case. Uh, the time constraint that we had to perform that task was uh, 50 time units, but it was performed under nine, uh, 90 time units. Therefore, the system adopts a weaker inc uh, encryption algorithm, which manages to perform uh, and uh, respect its timing constraints. And then we continue and we go down the, uh, the ranking table. And then we have enough uh, time select, we can go back to adopting uh, a stronger encryption algorithms here. So we have performed evaluation of, of our approach uh, by applying different CPU loads here. We, we go from 10% uh, to 50 and 70, and then back down to 10%. So in the first case, without the adaptation, we, we see that we have uh, uh, several cases of timing violations which are marked with the stars here, as you can see. And then we, uh, we, we, applied, uh, we, we applied the same scenario, but in, uh, by having uh, the adaptation mechanism, we can see that the number of uh, timing violations are, uh, are decreased. And uh, another interesting po uh, point here is that we managed to perform more encryption jobs uh, under a shorter uh, time period with this approach. So basically, we provide a stronger preservation of timing uh, properties here by adopting this adaptation mechanism. So uh, the idea is that this adaptation mechanism can be used as an option. So uh, it can be turned on and off during the execution of the system based on your need. But one point to remember also here is that if someone from outside knows that this is how the system works, uh, uh, attackers can also enforce the system to go uh, with some processing loads to adopt the weakest uh, encryption algorithm and therefore make things easier for themselves to penetrate the system. So uh, we talked about uh, uh, preservation of extra functional properties, but how do we know if uh, extra functional properties are violated or not? What we do here, we apply uh, monitoring techniques to get information about how the system is performing with respect to extra, its extra functional properties. Uh, we look at the case of timing properties and we introduce this concept of second layer scheduler to extend the monitoring capabilities of OSE real-time operating system, which we have been using in our uh, work. And we do this without modifying kernel, the kernel. And uh, this uh, second layer scheduler uh, helps us to enforce timing properties. And uh, we also bring uh, awareness about these different properties. So we, we say that this uh, scheduler is now semantically aware of different timing properties, such as deadline, execution time, uh, period, and so on. And also, we will have a look how this monitoring framework and information can be used to have a round trip uh, design method. 
We will also have a small, uh, uh, some small notes about the issue of accuracy in monitoring of functional properties. So, th so this is the overall idea that we have a high level model and then from that we generate a real time task. And we want the task to be specified in this way. While uh, with using uh, OC real time operating system, a real time task is simply specified by, having, by specifying a property for that task. So this second layer scheduler that we uh, create around the core scheduler is now aware of all these properties and then by using the capabilities of the core scheduler, it releases these tasks to the core scheduler and then takes care of their timing properties. And then the information that we achieve uh, by monitoring can also be fed back to the model if we need that. So this is the architecture of our solution. We have uh, two separate files, one for the parameters of this real-time uh, task and one that contains the, functional, uh, the, the functionality of the task in a C file. And then the, we have some helper processes that help to uh, start the system, create tasks for different, uh, different uh, real-time uh, tasks that are generated from the model and so forth. And then we create logging information for them. So we have applied it on a, a task set and I just uh, simply showed the result that we have here. So what we can get now is that we can see what was the a specified deadline that we have uh, we had for a specific task and then what was the actual completion time of that task. Similar, similarly, we can get detailed information about uh, the actual execution of that task and what was the worst execution time that was uh, specified for that uh, specific task. So our approach provides this feature that we can also have some predi predictability in the system. For example, we can now see how close are we to, uh, to missing a deadline and based on that we can perform adaptation in the system and reconfigure uh, the system to strengthen preservation of external functional properties and in here uh, particularly timing aspects. Uh, what we currently support is a static set of tasks but as a future extension we can also have a, a task a creation of new tasks during runtime and another nice feature that we have in our work is that the scheduling policy is configurable so it is read along with other tasks uh, when the system is uh, started for the first time. And uh, as we said, this monitoring information can also be used in, in, uh, as part of a round trip development solution. So here we have the high level models again, and then it goes uh, through several chains of transformations. And then we get some code that is uh, going to, be to run on our platform, which is extended with some monitoring features. So we have extended that, uh, uh, timing, uh, that uh, f uh, monitoring framework, which was only for timing with other uh, properties such as memory usage, uh, mean time between failures, throughput, and other properties. And what we get is now uh, this detailed information about properties at the system level, such as what is the total CPU load in the system. And also we can get the same information per uh, processes and tasks here. And then this information is uh, fed back and propagated back to the high level model so that the, uh, the designers can now uh, decide if there has been any violation or not and then uh, modify the models and when we have a code generation process then they can repeat the process and generate a system until they uh, end up with a satisfactory set of external fun functional properties. And this, this solution was applied on the AL2 subsystem from Ericsson and this is part of the result that we have got in that work. So uh, okay we perform monitoring to, uh, to get some uh, information to detect violations and so forth and to perform <coughs> adaptation. But the question here is uh, to what extent a monitored value represent the actual state of a system and uh, property that we are interested in. Uh, this was the question that uh, was interesting for us after performing this work. So we looked at uh, one factor that contributed to this accuracy issue as we call it monitoring time difference, which is basically captured here. So our question was uh, from the time that we initiated a request for monitoring until the time that we get the, uh, this monitoring information. Uh, will that time affect the, the result that we get by uh, applying the monitoring te technique? So this can be especially important in systems where we have uh, high uh, fluctuations in CPU load and uh, so forth. And we have done, a, we, we created a setup experiment and then we have, a, uh, for example, again in uh, using the OSC real-time operating system, we have a shell command that uh, wants to get the value of some uh, properties. It sends this request to a, request to a monitoring process and this monitoring process uh, tries to gather that value from the system. And we have a process that sets random values to a dummy property here as we call n. So what we observed was that uh, since this monitoring process needs to compete with other processes in the system, uh, this was the actual monitoring request time point that we initiated and wanted uh, the value of a property. 
And this was the actual time point that the monitoring was done. And uh, here is, uh, you see the discrepancy between the values that we have obtained for that property. So the actual value at that time point was this one, but the, the, the value that we got is uh, this. So we just did this experiment to be aware of this uh, issue and then uh, how to mitigate it. So we also have a, a priority-based monitoring in the sense that we tell the monitoring to, uh, process to fetch this value at a higher priority level that, than other uh, properties. And uh, the reason for that is, uh, for example, if we have uh, some uh, high fluctuations in uh, one of these uh, extra-functional properties or basically uh, the, the properties that we want to monitor, then we in this uh, manner we can uh, to somehow mitigate this uh, effect. Uh, our focus here was mainly on the magnitude of the change, but uh, uh, on the frequency of change, but the magnitude and trend of these changes will also be interesting to look at. And also it should be uh, noted that uh, the, the mere act of monitoring can also impact the information that we achieve by monitoring. For example, in case of OEC, uh, which, which uses signals to communicate between different tasks, so the monitor itself can be also generate some uh, new uh, signals in the system. Therefore, if you are interested in the, in the number of signals that are currently existing in the system, we can affect them by performing just the monitoring task itself. So this should be remembered. And finally, uh, there is always a trade-off between having monitoring features and other functions in the system. And as the last contribution of this work, uh, uh, we will have a look at the test framework that we have implemented uh, to test uh, uh, to, to, to verify the actual behavior of a system versus its ex expected behavior, and then we have extended it to generate test cases for timing properties. So what we do is basically that we have uh, time automata mo uh, models that describe the internal behavior of some components. We generate abstract test cases from them, and then uh, they are parsed and automatically uh, converted to concrete test cases, which are basically a, uh, executable test script, and this process is uh, fully automated. Then what we do in this, uh, in this concrete test case is that we time stamp these states that exist in the time automata and then we, we can determine some timing deviations with respect to the model that we have. We have applied this, uh, this solution on the break-by-wire system from Volvo and it also provides some uh, interesting features uh, as I talk about shortly. So basically by having models, we can capture the intended behavior of the system and then we can perform analysis to the, on the models to identify problems. And uh, the question is uh, whether the actual beha uh, behavior of the system at runtime matches, that, uh, matches the expected behavior of the system that is represent, represented and captured by the models. And if not, then again, this analysis that we have performed may not be valid anymore. So we should evaluate this. This idea is captured in this figure. So we have time, model, uh, time automata models that uh, describe the behavior of a system. We perform analysis on them, and then we get some results. So the question is, is uh, this set of results that we have uh, uh, achieved uh, valid still for this uh, system under test? This figure shows uh, the structure of uh, the test methodology and the tool chain that we have created for this. So. Uh, I don't bore you with the details, uh, simply we, we start with, natural uh, with requirements which are described in natural language. They are formulated in TCTL properties. We have it's the ADL model of the system. In, in this case, we have this uh, break-by-wire system. We have uh, time automata models that describe the behavior of these is ADL components. And we perform analysis in UPAL port. We get some uh, traces uh, as part of this analysis. And this trace is what we call uh, abstract test case here. It is uh, then fed to the test execution engine that we have, then it is uh, parsed through different parses that we have implemented. From them we create a Python test scripts and uh, they are run against the system under test and we get some results here. So this is basically the ISTDL model of the break by wire system that we have uh, uh, studied and it has, uh, uh, as part of it, it has the ABS functionality, the, the breaking functionality here. And other, for example, we have here the pedal sensors, then uh, we perform some calculations on the, uh, based on different factors in the system, such as the slip rate of different wheels, and then we decide if uh, the actuators should apply the braking force or not in the end. So this is the simple uh, idea of this uh, system. And here you can see uh, one of these uh, time automata <coughs> models uh, describing the behavior of this component. And here we, we are looking at the uh, TA model of the ABS function in the system. So we have some uh, clock constraints here on different uh, nodes and states, as you can see here. 
And then this, is, this basically decides if the slip rate uh, is uh, okay to apply the braking force or not. So this is simply it. And uh, uh, this, is the, 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 this is part of the abstract test case that we get in this system. Here you, you, uh, you see the metadata uh, meta information that we include uh, in our test case. Here the formulated uh, TCTL uh, requirement and that we evaluate. And uh, here is the, the body of the test case which is fed to the parser. So we have different states and transitions which are uh, visited in, in order as part of the analysis. And uh, we have some values on these uh, on variables at uh, various states. And what we want to achieve is that we want to test if the same set of states and transitions uh, are visited in the same order during runtime. Moreover, at the top, we also have a uh, timing requirement on this set of uh, states and transition, and that says that the end-to-end -end response time for this set of uh, states and transition should not be more than three time units. So this is part of the internal input that we get by applying uh, uh, our method and uh, by executing this test script. We, 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 we get timestamps when each state is visited during runtime, and by post-processing this information, we can then decide if, for example, we have violated these color constraints that we have on transition from one state to another. And also, uh, by, having, uh, by looking at the timing stamps of all the, the states, we can now decide if uh, the end-to-end -end response time from the beginning to the end was, uh, uh, was according to the requirement or not. So our solution provides for uh, uh, several interesting features. One of them is that we have now the defect localization uh, possibility. So we can identify on the transition between which two states we have violated uh, or there has been some violation. And then we can focus on that part of the system to start uh, root cause analysis for the problem. And also our approach has the potential to be extended for other uh, extra functional properties. For example, if in the same manner we have uh, information about uh, memory consumptions at each state, then we can, talk, we can also uh, uh, measure them with our test cases and then uh, evaluate if they are re respected or not. And finally, one uh, the important point to remember is that a pass verdict for the test cases does not necessarily mean the absence of bugs and errors in the system. It just helps to increase our confidence in the uh, product that we are developing and delivering. So now we, uh, we will have a look at the uh, future directions and uh, conclusion points from this uh, presentation. <coughs> so we, we talked that uh, preservation, we have a look at uh, how uh, important is this uh, issue of preservation of extra uh, functional properties in embedded systems. And we introduced several uh, methods uh, to, to strengthen and provide this preservation at uh, various uh, levels and during different phases of development. Our focus here in this work was mainly on timing uh, properties plus some, uh, to some extent on security aspects in the system, but as we discussed, uh, they can be extended for other extra functional properties. There is a possibility to optimize system, a uh, system with respect to extra functional properties of that system. We have provided already a solution to op for optimization with respect to non-functional requirements. Also be aware of the ac uh, accuracy issue when you perform monitoring and also that uh, the act of monitoring can uh, affect the result that you're achieving uh, by monitoring activities. So uh, this I already covered that the testing framework can be extended for, for example, memory, uh, for testing memory uh, properties in the system. And another interesting uh, future direction of our work is extending the uh, uh, the solutions for monitoring and testing in multi-core systems. For example, we have tasks that are deployed on different cores and we want to measure the end-to-end -end response time uh, that, uh, for a set of tasks that are uh, running on various uh, cores in the system. Then another point to remember here is that preservation of uh, extra functional properties can be applied at different uh, granularity levels and uh, it can have then a more restrict, uh, restrictive preservation or less restrictive. For example, if you consider here we have a composite component com uh, that is composed of two child components. If we apply a preservation uh, on this, for example, to preserve its timing properties, then it, it will be less restrictive uh, than the case that we enforce and uh, preserve timing properties of these uh, child components here. And finally, the solutions that uh, we propose in this work can help uh, as a set of means to have better quality assurance in building embedded systems. So that was all, and thanks uh, for your attention. <laughs>